Hi, it's Jackie here from the LGFA, and we're back with the final part of our mini series, looking at some key studies uh, conducted by Dr. Irene Hogan, who is the assistant lecturer at the Department of Sport, Leisure and Childhood Studies at the Munster Technological University, MTU, Cork Campus, Bishopstown, County Cork. We're off to a good start, Irene. I managed to get through all of that without a stumble. So good to have you back on board. And William Harmon, of course, our much loved National Development Officer with Remit for Coach Education, one of the very, very best in the business. Folks, how are we doing? Good, thanks, Jackie. Yeah, good to be good back here again. Good to be back, good to have you on board. So in our first two shows, we were looking at your comprehensive studies, uh, Irene, as part of your PhD. Then we talked about some of the results from that, some of the outcomes. And now we're going to move on to a call to action and how we can implement some best practice in our various clubs. And of course, your study was conducted uh, looking at the experiences of female coaches primarily within uh, the LGFA. So you've broken it down nicely in a document I have in front of me here. So call to action, uh, you've broken down into three categories, mainly Irene, targeted recruitment, appropriate retention strategies, and coach development and support. So where do you, uh, with your vastly superior knowledge to me, want to kick off with all of this today, Irene? Yeah, I suppose it's about maybe what can clubs do on the ground now. So we know what the experience for women coaches are at the end of the study. And now it's about, well, what can we put into action? What can we put into place? And I suppose for all coaches um, in their clubs and the club executive, I think we probably need to start to maybe do a mini audit on where are we now? So how many coaches have we? What's the kind of the split? You know, how many female coaches have we? How many male coaches? Uh, you know, other um, backgrounds. Look and see, well, what, what are our current coaches doing? What is their role? What's their predominant role? Are our female coaches in there is just that FLO role? Uh, looking at what are their qualifications maybe? Um, then maybe even just working out how long are they there? And why have they stayed in that role for so long? So kind of that you're just getting a picture of what's going on currently in your club. Maybe having a chat to those that have said at the, and I know it's AGM time at the moment. So maybe someone that said, I'm not coming back next year. Uh, why is that the case? Is it something that's going on in the club environment? So I think that would be step one for clubs to just do an audit on where are we now? And then I suppose next step then is for the recruitment. So traditionally, I presume a lot of clubs are in the same boat, but the research uh, showed me that a lot of the women coaches you know, females in clubs just weren't really approached when it came to coaching. It was yeah. the approaching the dad in the home. It was approaching the ex-footballer uh, or hurler uh, on the men's side. And maybe we didn't just target the women as much. And I suppose then we are losing out on half of our potential uh, coaches going forward. So for all our roles, just to approach the women. So I would say that's step one, Jackie, is to, that real targeted recruitment. The overall generic text out seeking help or looking for help doesn't really work whereas someone in the club saying listen what what are you what's your skill set what could you bring to this this is where our gaps are we're looking for someone to be able to fill this role how would you be fixed for that that tends to have a bigger impact than the anyone willing to help text i suppose that go out so that would be step one would be the targeted recruitment brilliant so we, we touched on some key themes to emerge from your studies as well Iron, and you've kind of touched on it there again, that unconscious bias that the, yeah. some people will go towards the male rather than the female. Um, so you've nicely broken down in terms of a call to action by whom, when, how, and the implications of that. Um, Iron, this is a good time. Uh, you know, the, the, the competitive season for, for many clubs is, is, is almost over. You're planning ahead for 2023. So, uh, and William, bring in on this as well. This is a good time to review and plan uh, what next steps for, for the club. Yeah, I think that's important. And sometimes we don't self-reflect enough or sometimes we don't probably just take a time to review. You know, it's all helter-skelter. And normally what happens is when the season finishes, everybody downs tools. And you know what? We'll think about, we'll think about that now in January or February. You know, we'll think about recruiting people. But actually now is probably the ideal time that 
when you don't have those other competing interests of games and competitive uh, matches and, and everything else going on, it's a nice time just to review where you're at as a club, where are those gaps as outlined by Irene, uh, by Irene, and then maybe identify potential personnel that you could be getting involved in the teams. Um, so I think sometimes we just down tools and we just say, right, that's it. We see in January, when actually now is the probably time to start that, that recruitment process in terms of uh, identifying who you need from next year. Uh, yeah. I think, I mean, that's probably just my observation. I know, Jack, you probably have a similar, when you see your own clubs that, you know, when the, when the competition's finished, it's like, oh, right, we, we park that for a while, do you know? Yeah, and we actually have a video up at the moment. Um, it's part of our uh, monthly series. You've probably seen seen it, uh, folks. Um, Heroes of today inspire the next generation. And, and this month's one features Paula uh, from uh, Westmead, who's the county secretary there. And she talks about the very same kind of stuff. It's a great time of the year to be planning your AGM, looking back and also looking forward. Um, so, Irene, on that point, uh, what, what can people do within clubs now to to identify new people and to retain the existing people within their clubs. Yeah, I think it's about that, the kind of the getting to know them and understanding what is their skill set and what can they bring to the party. And I know one club that I worked with last year on their registration form that the parents were filling in on their uh, girls that were starting in the club or continuing in the club. They asked them, you know, listed out all the different volunteer roles that are needed in a club. So everything from your, you know, ringing your referees to a being on the fundraising committee and they got the parents to kind of identify which one of these they might be interested in volunteering in or which ones they could volunteer in so then they had a kind of a ready-made database that they could go back and say well actually now what we're trying to do is get more money into the club these four parents said that they would be interested in helping out with that that's what they've identified as their strength so they had someone to go and target straight away and that's what I mean by kind of being really targeted in your recruitment um, and then once we get them in I suppose we need to, to support them in whatever their role is. So if they're coming in as coaches, they do need a kind of an induction pack or a starter pack that you'd get if you started any new job. But when mm. we come in as coaches, it's kind of, oh, should they know what they're at? And we just leave them off. And I suppose it's about, you know, telling someone that's coming new into our sport, maybe, or definitely into coaching, they need to be told what's the lie of the land here? How do I organise a match? How do I book our pitch? How do I send out texts to the group? You know, how do I organise a referee? So that there's that induction pack that you're not just left to your own devices. And that starts the, the retention strategies part then. Like if you have a really good experience on your first couple of nights there, well, the chances are you're going to stick with it. You know, you're going to stay with the club then. I think that's a big one actually, Irene, in terms of like, and in general, and we've kind of mentioned it in the other two series, that it, the, it, for retention purposes, they say if you have a good early experience, yeah. you're more likely to stay involved. So if you're getting someone new involved or someone coming back, that early guidance and support and is very important because then people feel value in part of the process and they know who to go to if they have issues or problems or you know they want someone to get a bit of advice on. So that early support and guidance is probably the key. If you put a, a lot of effort into that those first few weeks or months then you know, you'll find that these uh, the, the volunteers will actually become more competent and confident in their role and probably will stay involved as a result. And then word of mouth will go out. They'll probably you know, sell the club to other people that are saying, gee, you know what? I've really had a good experience here. Joe, you know, get involved. And I just think, I, I know that myself, that people who get good early guidance and support, get a good experience, will probably have a positive message in the community, which they will attract more people involved. So uh, I think that's just important. Uh, and William, I suppose that it's very important to be organised then as a club. I mean, for example, if a new coach is coming in, that they know where everything is. I mean, this this might be a, a fairly basic point, but where where is the equipment that they need to, to lay out a session? These kind of small little things, these small details that might become so big for somebody. They, they arrive onto the pitch one night, the, the gate's not open. Where are the cones? Where are the footballs? All of these kind of mini parts that just make up a, a, a the larger wheel. Yeah, do you know, just from our own conversations, like we were having, I know Irene probably mentioned their short, you know, soon about community practice and the benefit of coaches talking, but they mentioned an awful about organizational issues are the, you know, a lot of discussions around that. So, time. Yeah. where do I get my equipment? How do I book the pitch? 
geez, how do we make sure we don't have, you know, a duplication in terms of oh. number of teams on a pitch? Where do I get the jerseys? How do I get the referees? So, like, all those organizational issues are probably things that, you know, and you know what? They're probably common to every club. They come up every year. So if we have that process whereby we're meeting regularly as coaches, we're discussing these things, they know who to go to, who even to ask is, is a huge thing. But a lot of those things, uh, Jackie, would be organisation issues. And a lot of clubs have the same questions. And, if, and as you said, you can have frequently asked questions whereby, listen, guys, if, this, if you have an issue here, this is where you go to or this is who you contact. Yeah, I think a lot of those things really are, are, um, are, are, are we probably just assume they're all going to be taken care of when, when in fact people don't know what to do with those uh, circumstances, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And Irene, so again, under under the uh, three headings we're discussing: targeted recruitment, appropriate retention strategies, coach development, and support. Anything else that you feel is massively important to touch on here today? I think even as well under that kind of the induction pack and the starter pack and what goes on in that. I think taster sessions is something as well. A lot of the women coaches were really. Um, kind of would have liked to have had happen, but it didn't happen in their club. So, you know, they so, don't sorry, know what... So rather being thrown in at the deep end, that they have a little... Yeah, bit, yeah, that they just maybe bringing everyone in that's a new, just to, what's the structure of our training sessions? Back to that organisation side of things. But, you know, when, you know, what is a warm-up? How long does a warm-up go on for? So they might have done their coach education by the time they start with you but what does a typical session look like for another eight or another 10 or another 12 and it's again it's about gaining the confidence like William said and having that that information there from the start means that your first experience is a positive one as opposed to some of the stories I heard where you were given your bag of footballs and told we'll see you again uh, when you need more or at the end of the year so that would be the start of it and then yeah I suppose knowing what your coaches can do and assigning them to or your volunteers in general assigning them to roles that they're comfortable in doing will mean that they're not going to be frightened off by being given, you know, so if I was given to be in charge of the social media, that would be something I definitely could not do. So, you know, so don't give that to the likes of me, but understand where I'm coming from. And then it's back to the biases that has come up in, in the session one and two as well. You know, don't just go to the women in your club and say we need a female liaison officer. Or, you know, so do look at them as potential coaches, potential um, officers, you know, don't pigeonhole them into one or the other. And then it's back to like William was saying, the, the kind of the development and the support then that you feel throughout your time and throughout the season. So chats with your fellow coaches, having that member maybe on the club executive that you can go to this volunteer type officer that can be your point of contact should you need them. I think that's really important to have these coaching discussions or just volunteer discussions maybe we need to start having all the club officers having a chat to talk a chance to talk to each other outside of our club meetings yeah so, I, I, a few things there like I mean, like you know the first thing you said about you know the coaches come in I'm sorry I just hope from my own coaching experience here in, in the club that we used to have to do it Saturday morning and what we do is we always bring in the coaches before the Saturday morning session start at the academy you know so we brought in all the coaches from the under sixes the eights and the tens into you know and we just show them how the station is laid out Show them what station they're going to be in. Show them, you know, what games can they be playing. Went through the basic skills and went through the, the key teaching points so that they can spot and fix. And that was really beneficial in terms of, you know, two weeks later when they started, they had everything set up and ready to go and they looked really well organized. So therefore people looking from the outside in are going, well, geez, you know what? That, that, looks, that looks all ready to go and set up. So you can't underestimate those taster sessions or those support sessions. I like the idea of coaching meeting together because, as I say, you know, taking yourself out of the, the health or skelter of, of our competitions and you need to have a, a situation in your clubs whereby coaches just get together maybe once every two months, maybe once or every quarter, whatever it is, whereby they just come in and chat about coaching and just say, well, how are things going for you? And, you know, what is your issue or concern at the moment? Jeez, you know what? I have a big group there. How do we deal with that? Okay, well, have anybody else had that experience? Okay, can we chat and discuss? Because nine times out of ten, the, the, the answer is in the room. But even getting coached together on a regular basis, I mean, is really important in terms of yeah. just chatting. That's, and that support and guidance is, is, is important, you know? That jumps out here from the document you've put together, Aaron, and it's, it's, a, it's a team, it's, a, it's an overriding theme right through here, is sharing knowledge, having discussions, communication, and uh, I love the way you've put it down, I mean, it's very, very obvious on an ongoing basis to ensure that the, the, the changes or the, or the process that you're implementing 
that just don't drop off the face of the planet mm. that they're long term and sustainable mm. yeah and I suppose that's something we're guilty of and I don't know we're all guilty of it as, as individuals and as clubs that you know we kind of do the one hit wonder you know we might put a community practice in place for this season or this off season or you know we do the psychology talks or the nutrition talks or the, the fitness testing and you know and we come in and we do it once and then we kind of go well that's that box tick now yeah, but yeah. for this and for the coach education and development of the coaches and the support of coaches it has to be ongoing but one key thing and I think William you were kind of alluding to it as well is that it has to be context specific and what I mean by that is the under 12 coaches Coach, meeting the adult team coach it isn't maybe what they're looking for well from the women coaches I spoke to it's definitely not what they're looking for they would much rather have just the under 12 coaches talking together and having opportunities for those conversations and then once we're kind of comfortable in that environment well now we can talk to the under 14 coaches because our under 12 girls are going there next we can talk to the under 10 coaches because their girls are coming to us next so it's that continuity as you go along but I suppose we have to take it in steps because this is a new uh, maybe concept to a lot of clubs. So we can't go straight in with let's do a community practice for all coaches in our club. I think we need to start a step before that where we just have the coaching conversations for the groups I'm working with. So just my three or four coaches that are working with me. Let's chat. Let's plan. Let's let's debrief at the end of the training session. But currently what's happening from the women I spoke to, what's happening is our training is half seven. We're down there 20 past seven. We're running around. We're getting the stuff. You take the warm up. I'll do the main drill. You take the game. And then we're finishing. It's like, oh, let's collect all the stuff, start any injuries, organize the next match. And we're home. So there's no time. There's no opportunity for those coaching discussions. So I just think it needs to be context specific to start off with. And then we can look a bigger club picture than after. And I think with that, uh, like I'd be advocating everyone here that's listening into this is that your club coaching officer could play a really good role in that. Just even getting people together and facilitate. And don't worry about, you know, well, what would we do when we bring them together? It's very simple. Power things go for you. You know, okay. power things. And I guarantee you, you know, the conversation will go on. And just keep it nice and short, maybe about 40 to an hour, just asking the question. So if there are any coaching, club coaching officers, looking like, well, how do I set this up? It's basically saying, come way down, you know, we'll meet maybe, you know, the first Monday of every three months or whatever, and we'll just sit down and we'll just ask the question, how are things going? You know, how, how can we help you? How can we support you? And it's as simple as that, isn't it, Irene? It's not a real Absolutely. kind of, you know, you know it's not yeah. this kind of, you know, you have to have a certain agenda. It's very much just sit down over a cup of tea and see how are things going. And, and you're taking yourself out of that, that environment. Yeah. And you're just chatting. And there, there might be much to talk about, but at least you made that effort to get people together. And you're providing that opportunity to have those chats and those discussions because the opportunity isn't there at the moment. They're just getting through, you know, getting their team out, getting their training sessions done. So give them that opportunity to have the chat within the club environment. You don't need an expert. You don't need a facilitator coming in. You can just, as William said, have those chats. Um, it's very easy to tell every coach coming in to come in with one scenario that they'd like to help, you know, help with working on. It could be something specific to the pitch. It could be training wise, or it could be to do with player and, you know, and minding our players and the player athlete relationship or player coach relationship. All right, all right, the, the way you laid out the document, and I keep going back to it because it, 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 it's okay, it's step by step and it's it's call to action, call to action, call to action. But it could actually be a flow chart because everything seems to be intertwined and interlinked in, in it as well. You could actually have it as a circular um, a document as well. But if there, was, if there was some key items to pull out, now everything within it, it, it is important. But if there are some key items that you could pull from the document that if they're not looked after, this is all going to fall apart. What What are the main things? I know we've touched to on me, a few of them already. Yeah, what are the main it's, things it's, that people need the, to be aware of? It's the support and the development element. And that is happening from the first minute they come in the gate or the first minute you ask them to get involved. So you need to support them and develop them from then. So to me, if we can do that, if we can support and develop our coaches, we won't need to do as much recruiting because we will have retained our coaches. So, you know, but I just think that's that we need to start maybe with just finding out what's going on currently. You know, a lot of clubs might even know how many coaches they have or volunteers they have in the club. You know, the person that might know that might be the children's officer because they have to have their certs and on file. But, you know, like how many have we? How many are there with the last 10 years? How many are there with the last two years? You know, just to kind of keep an eye on it and kind of maybe benchmark where were we last year? Will we five more volunteers this year? 
and we've lost nobody. Great. You know, are having five more volunteers, but we lost seven. So, you know, just I think for clubs to maybe that's the place to start, do your audit, see where you're at and then try and do the support and development element for your existing coaches and volunteers. Um, that to me would be this was the starting point. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, William, I, one thing that stands out for me here that Iron's written down, um, what is it? There's loads. There's absolutely loads. Coaches <laughs> feel understood and valued. I yeah. put that, that's just massive, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, I don't, like, and that's, that's key to it. Feeling part of something, you know, feeling that, you know, what you're adding to something. And that's what I'm saying about if you regularly talk to people, communicate with people, listen to people's views and feedback, listening is, is something that is, is very important as well. I think people can feel that they're part of something. Do you know, I'm here and, and you know what? You're also here to support me when I'm trying to do. I think even get that synergy going in a club, in a club environment. I think you can be, you can be very powerful because as I said, if someone has positive experiences, the word of mouth is unbelievable, whereby they will talk to two or three other people about the experiences they're having with, in your club. So therefore, then next year, when you're looking for new people, they'll always, you know, relate to the, you know, uh, and I, you, what you actually find is probably people will start coming to you. Like I always hear in clubs going, Jesus, it's very hard to get volunteers, you know, but I've actually found that over, if you, if you can bring a process of that continuing plan, do, review, constantly reviewing what you're doing, you're, you're raising your standards, you will actually find, and I always find this, people will get involved if they're in a well-run ship. Correct. And it goes back uh, to the organisation like piece we are talking about earlier on. Yeah. Well, if yeah. they know, they know if you know if I'm coming in here and I'm going to be supported and guided, and I'm going to be listened to and I'm going to be valued, then they'll want to get involved. People will won't want to get involved if they feel, you know what, oh, I don't know how that how that how that club's run, you know. But so that's important that that planning organization is very important, and also that communication is key. Um, like you know, there's, that's just my thought process on it. But um, I just think that planning, the the, the put the detail into the planning now. The organization now and then communicate well with people i think i think is a we you go a long way it's huge i think we've covered we've covered loads in it you know talk about the discussion piece working to their strengths so they're comfortable with their role it all feeds into an improved environment and it enables women to be considered for coaching roles um Irene, maybe just touch on um the time i know we've chatted about this previously but it's very important and particularly from the female perspective the time pressures that yeah. that 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 women face. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's people need decade. to be aware of that. Yeah, and I think just a kind of an understanding of why the things have changed and they are improving. The majority of the the caring responsibilities, the responsibilities within the home, still fall to the woman in the home. So you know, an understanding of that, I suppose, and. Then obviously for um, those that have children and the timing of when they have children and how much they can actually commit time wise. And for a lot of them, and this is back to the point of if it's a good uh, ship and a good organization and good environment, well, then the hour or two a week that they have to volunteer or to, to give time to something, well, they'll give it to the ladies football club if that's the right place. Other than that, if they're having any challenges or if it is a kind of an element of bias going on or not an understanding of where they're coming from, well, then they'll go to the other sport or to the other organization or charity. So they have X amount of time every week to give. Um, and then it, they'll, they'll just use it from my research. They'll just go to where um, they see the best use of their time back to being valued again. So it is back to that kind of they all feed into each other, really. OK, but guys, we could we could chat away about the, the, there's so much more we, we could actually get through on this. But I think we've over the course of the three shows, we, we, we've touched on an awful lot. And I hope there's some key messages that people can take away from from the three shows so guys i'd like to thank you so much for your time dr irene hogan and, and uh, william harman from the lgfa as well it's just been a, a really enjoyable uh, few shows i have to say so um thanks so much and, and um i hope that people if people perhaps who are who are looking at these shows if they want to get in touch irene is that okay yeah. 
Absolutely, yeah. You'll find me um, in, down in MTU or on the LGFA website as a coach developer. And that table that you're that we're kind of talking from that was on the Pell magazine, the, the most right. recent Pell magazine, or the second last one. If people want to have a look at that, or I'm not sure, um, my technology had it as a word document, but maybe a flow chart sometime or other. Jackie might be a good idea. No, or it's, it's if that, I don't know if that table can be zoomed up at the end or whatever. And um, that's you know the. It, it's not a secret document or anything like that. Well, it's there for we can share it as a JPEG or a PNG. No yeah, problem. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Sorry, and also, William. Yeah. And also, we have a. We're actually going to do a, a webinar on this as well. I think it's around March. I think Irene, we we're going to do a specific webinar on this. So we, right. uh, on that webinar, we can share any documents that you have from your research and what you're talking about now, and that'll be up in our LGFA YouTube channel as well for people to to look at, to look over under the coach education playlist. So we're actually doing a webinar on this topic again around March. So again, we, we keep the we keep it on top of our lips in terms of our conversation. Great stuff, William. Well, we encourage people to when they um when 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 details of the webinar are announced to, to bounce on and to to get as much knowledge and information as they as they can. So to wrap it up, Dr. Irene Hogan, thank you so much for your time. William Harmon, thank you so much for your time, folks. It's been very, very informative and I hope people get a lot out of it. So thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, William.